Alrighty, let's get in Josh Brown on Amazon. Rotations. I was making the point the other day um, that there there have been rotations internally within the Mac Seven this year. It's fascinating. Apple falls out of favor. All of a sudden, the stock market falls in love with Amazon again. Can we pop a chart on uh, AMZN? This is an all-time high as we speak. I'm issuing a, 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 an alert here. If people don't understand, <laughs> this is the new Apple. This is the name that now everyone all of a sudden finds themselves chasing and wondering why they don't own, they don't own enough of. I love that. I don't want all seven of these stocks going up together and going down together. This is better. It's healthier. I agree. It's more rational yep. and it's more meaningful. Why is Amazon doing what it's doing right now? They have all of the tailwinds. They have the AI platform. They have the e-commerce that's firing on all cylinders. They have the cost-cutting story. True. They have it all. That's True. why this stock is working and others in the Mag 7 but, aren't. Now, you have a bit of a comeback, though, in Apple at 183.55. Yeah, um, it's fine. So it's had a nice comeback. JP Morgan's retail trader radar, something they put out within the Mag 7. People, retail traders, uh, were selling NVIDIA. Take it some. If you're wondering how much I have invested in Amazon, here's the number. Look at this Amazon Prime truck. Go around the neighborhood. There it is. Uh, it's woo, woo, it's flirting with $200,000 in the public account. Uh, we're up $86,663 so far on this. I think we'll be up a lot more <laughs> before it's all said and done, right? Uh, I mean, Amazon's just one of those companies that just have so much growth over this next, you know, 10 years. It's insane. Amazon's one of the, f you know, one of few companies in the market that every dip's a buy. Amazon's one of those companies. Meta's one of those companies. I actually think, uh, you know, Tesla now at this point in time is one of those companies. I think Shopify is one of those companies. You know, you got some of those sorts of, of companies out there that literally every single, actually, I think Cheesecake Factory is actually one of those companies. I know they're just a little little teeny company, but they're one I actually look at and I'm like, every single dip in that stock's a buy. And so um, overall, very, very happy with my Amazon investment and it's gonna do me a lot better in the future. It's doing a Druckenmiller and buying Apple. Mm. So, you know, Liz, they've looked at the laggards and there's been, as Josh says, a bit of a rotation within the Mag 7 too. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things that, and I don't really know the answer to this on a specific stock basis, but one of the things that I feel like has started to happen is that the AI trade became kind of a zero-sum game. You've got one company that'll come out and say, we're going to spend a ton to get further ahead on AI. They get maybe punished for the spending. And then who's the beneficiary of that spending? They get rewarded. Instead of what had been happening for the better part of the last six to 12 months, where you just say the word AI and the stock gets rewarded, now people are being more choosy about what in AI are you spending on? Do you have enough money to spend on that? And if you are spending, who gets that spending? I think investors are getting exhausted with all of the spending and are going to start to reward stocks much more for cost cutting and being more judicious mm -hmm. with just laying it out. Basically, Can I tack something onto that really quickly? Yeah. Uh, uh, that's such a great point. And one of the things happening with Amazon specifically, uh, I think this month they announced AWS has now crossed above a 100 billion dollar annual run rate business. If it were a standalone company, it would be S&P 50, in my opinion. That's yeah, where would. the valuation would put it. it would be. That's buried within Amazon. It's a lot of the company's overall growth. But understand, the spending, the way that AWS has set itself up in AI, bedrock AI, it is LLM agnostic. Bring us whatever AI tools you want, you can run them on AWS. I think that that's the right approach. I don't agree with the approach of bidding up the company that has the most invested in ChatGPT, for example. Because ChatGPT may not be the thing that people are talking about in six months. So I like the platform play, and I think that's another reason why we're seeing Amazon break out to new all-time highs. It's up 9% month to date. As we said, it, it hit a record high. So let me be very, very clear here, okay? JB is 100% right, 100% right in my opinion, in regards to the thought process of making sure you're kind of more of like a platform, be the one that sells the shovels in this situation, right? Because once again, ChatGPT might be the hot thing now, it might be something else a year from now, three years from now, five years from now, right? You wanna be the one that's supporting everything. And uh, I also think Meta's doing you know, a very similar thing with kind of their llama models and what they're working on there, and so, I think any of these companies that are really the ones that are selling the shovels is magical, right? And so uh, maybe there's not going to be as big of an 
a growth curve for those companies as if you hit it out of the ballpark with the actual product, like a Palantir, for instance, like a product specific. But overall, it's more like the steady growth story and it's less of a risk, right, in, in regards to that. So, man, oh, man, I love Amazon. Absolutely love Amazon. I mean, just growth levers everywhere all over that company. Mr. Brad Gerstner up first in regards to Tesla. Speaking of driving, autonomous driving and the like in Tesla, which you revealed on our program the last time we spoke. What takes it from a quote unquote small position to something larger? What do you need to see from Elon and, and that company from here? He's all like, can you tell everybody to shut up in the background, please? <laughs> well, first, let me say, I think Elon's done an extraordinary job, and I think his advantage in AI and full self-driving relative to all the other manufacturers in the world is deeply underappreciated. I described FSD 12 as a chat GPT moment for self-driving. After 10 years um, of, of marginal improvements, we had a profound breakthrough around the imitation learning of FSD 12. Um, I think that will be an incredibly valuable asset to the company. I don't think it's an asset that can be replicated by other OEMs in the United States. They simply lack the data. And this is data in, pixels in, and control plane out. So unless you have the data, you're going to have a very hard time catching Tesla and full self-driving. I don't think BYD is going to be able to, uh, you know, play in that game either. And I thought it was fascinating. At the moment that the United States is banning TikTok, that the Chinese government is providing permission to Tesla to do full self-driving in partnership with Baidu in China. It shows the resilience and the strength of the relationships uh, that Elon Musk has in China and that Tesla has in China, um, you know, and their own push toward AI. So I think, you know, you can't think of the company as an auto company. You have to think of it as a technology company today. We think that it's, you know, fully valued. It's been a, it's been a volatile ride. Uh, but we think this may be one of the companies that can break through on energy, can break through on AI and FSD. And so we're paying very close attention because if we start to see the adoption and the conversion on FSD that we think is possible, this will be a story like Apple and services, where services becomes an increasingly important part of their, uh, of their profit makeup. Boom, boom, boom. So important what he just said right there. So important. He talked about Elon Musk's relationship in China with the top dogs, right? And uh, his relationship's phenomenal. And that can never be overstated. Like, that, that needs to be talked about. I think that's a, you know, when you think about the biggest market for Tesla long term and even short term, it, it is China. It's much bigger opportunity than even the United States is, right? And even than all of Europe is. And so when I look out there, I say, I like that Elon Musk has a great relationship with those folks. And I can tell you, folks in China, they have a lot of respect and admiration for Elon Musk. I mean, a lot. I think a lot more than even a lot of Americans do, just to be quite frank. They have a lot of respect for him. They look up to him. They, they think he's a brilliant genius. And, um, and, you know, that's something China's done for a while. They had so much respect, I remember, for Steve Jobs back in the day. If you didn't know, Steve Jobs... He was the one that was in charge of Apple back when Apple really went into China and really built out that relationship in China with Foxconn and to really start developing the phones over there and in terms of being built and whatnot and uh, all those sorts of products, right? And so they had so much respect for, for Steve Jobs back in the day. And so they really looked to these sorts of folks that are the innovators, that are kind of the game changers, that are like the, the leaders of future technologies, and they just, they really they really have a lot of respect for them. So, yeah, I, I don't think that gets talked about enough, uh, just to be honest, right? All right, next one up here, legendary investor Stanley Druckenmiller, speaking about AI and maybe some other subjects. Sort of came in, it, into play with that discussion because you're worried that it's going to take a lot of investment and there's no savings we got to build up the defense. There's wars everywhere. And you, you were early with NVIDIA. You were early with, with AI. You, you pared back a little bit, but are not less bullish on the prospects for it, are you? Well, first of all, I wasn't early with NVIDIA. My young partner was early with NVIDIA. Um, he, he called me in in the fall of 22 and said that he thought all this excitement about blockchain was going to be far outweighed by AI. And um, I asked him how to play it, and he told me I should buy this company, NVIDIA. I didn't even know how to spell it. Um, I bought it. Then a month later, ChatGPT happened. Even an old guy like me could figure out 
okay, what that meant. So I increased the position substantially. Um, I said in an interview in June of that year that I expected to own NVIDIA for two or three years, that this was a mega trend like I'd never seen, potentially bigger than the internet. Um, but when the stock went from 150 to 900, I'm not Warren Buffett. I don't own things for 10 or 20 years. I wish I was Warren Buffett. <laughs> um, and 150 to 900, yes, we did, we did, we did cut that position and a lot of other positions uh, in late March. I just need a break. We've had a, we've had a hell of a run. A lot of what we recognized uh, has become recognized by the marketplace now. Powell was, we expected Powell to come back and repivot, which he subsequently did. Um, but no, long term, we're as bullish on AI as we've ever been. I also, you just wonder, if we were all sitting here in 1999 talking about the internet, or anybody was talking about it, I don't think anybody would have estimated it would be as big as it got in 20 years. Um, we didn't have the iPhone, we didn't have Uber, we didn't have Facebook, yada, yada. Um, and yet, if you bought the NASDAQ in 99, it went down 80% before that all came to fruition. That's not going to happen with AI, but it could rhyme. AI could rhyme with the Internet as, as we go through all this capital spending we need to do. The payoff, while it's incrementally coming in by the day, um, the big payoff might be four to five years from now. So AI might be a little overhyped now, but underhyped long term. He said you're not. So very important what he brings out there. And, and he, he could be tr accurate with that. But I'll say this. OK, the big difference, in my personal opinion, in regards to the situation is now every, all these big companies have seen the stakes. Right, they, they they know what is at risk here. Okay, they know business models can be disrupted very negatively if they don't spend on this stuff. They know that if they capitalize on this, these are you know hundreds of billions of dollars of opportunities, trillions of dollars of opportunities, and the internet really taught us that, right? And so that's why a lot of these big dog companies they can't really pull back on their spend. They have to actually keep increasing the spend. With at the end of the day, it's Nvidia, right? Because they're the big dog in the space, and if you want to take this stuff serious. You better be buying NVIDIA chips. And so that's the one differentiator. I think in the internet boom, we hadn't really seen something come along that was was such a game changer, right? Now every business leader out there has seen, oh my gosh, if only I had invested more into mobile, into mobile technology, into, you know, a lot of different spaces, social media, those sorts of things, right? Um, you know, file sharing, video sharing, the cloud, I mean, now everybody's kind of seen it, and so now everybody's kind of seeing the next opportunity, which is AI, and they're saying, we can't miss this, especially if it's a longer-term focus for person. If it's a kind of an older CEO who's kind of just a traditional CEO, they might not care as much, right, because they're just there for the next you know, couple of years, maybe. But if it's a longer-term CEO, like a Zuckerberg, for instance, or an Elon Musk that is planning on leading their companies for the next 10, 20, 30 years those people look at it very differently because they're like, we're going to be around as the big dog still when these things are, are coming to fruition. And so it's a different viewpoint there. So I don't know. They, they, I think he brought up a, a good point, but I do think there's, there's some key differences. Warren Buffett, but what you just did with NVIDIA sounds an awful lot like what he did with Apple. He paired his position in Apple by 13% and then went on to say it's a better company than Coca-Cola or American Express or any of the other companies that they have in their portfolio. And he thinks Tim Cook is great. Yeah, well, I will be very surprised if I don't own NVIDIA on and off um, the next you, 10 years. You're, you're so bullish on AI. Andrew, you did uh, a, a great interview with Perplexity, and, and uh, I think that that's where you decided might be a place that, that, that you want yep. to be. I love Perplexity. Um, again, a funny story, my... Young partner, the one who has like basically room. been behind all our AI play with with, with his uh, with his staff. Um, he told me, I don't know, in January that all the kids on the West Coast weren't using ChatGPT or Google anymore. They were using this thing called Perplexity AI. 
So um, I, of course, tried it out, and it was just unbelievable. It's, a, it's an answer machine, but the speed, but the depth of the answers and the quality, and then the fact that they give you the sources if you want to go deeper, it was nothing like I've ever seen. If you don't believe me, just ask ChatGPT, Gemini, and Perplexity a question and get the answer and you'll see, you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. I fell so in love with it. Um, we tried to get in on a round um, that we were lucky enough to be accommodated. I love the founder, Aravind Srinivas. Um, he's super aggressive and with his team, super innovative, but he's also got humility. He's everything we love in a founder. So, okay, so the important thing to understand whenever you got a new technology like this is you want to be in more of the obvious winners and not take as much risk in the maybes, right? So even ChatGPT, I'd say is a maybe. Like if there's maybe ChatGPT is the next Google or maybe it's the next Yahoo search or maybe it's the next Ask Jeeves for any of my OGs out there. You remember Ask Jeeves back in the day? Like we don't know, right? Maybe this perplexity thing is actually the next Google or maybe it's some other service. That's, that's, we don't know. So you want to bet on the obvious winners in a race, right? So the obvious winners to me in AI, there's a, there's a few companies that are so obvious to me. One is Meta. Meta is clear as day an obvious winner in AI. Not just from what they're doing with the llama models, but for what they're doing in regards to serving up videos, images, things like that on Instagram, Facebook, that or things that you know you're gonna engage with, right? And so the AI being trained better and better and better to know, okay, they don't wanna see this, they wanna see this, they're gonna engage with this, those sorts of things. That is extremely, extremely valuable. So Meta's an obvious winner to me. Another obvious winner to me is NVIDIA. NVIDIA is a clear day winner. Like there's no question about that, right? Like they're gonna to continue to sell the shovels. They're gonna to continue to sell the shovels to everybody trying to dig for the gold. And so they're a clear as day winner to me. And then if we look outside of that, another clear as day winner to me in, in regards to AI is, you know the company. We spoke about it at the beginning of this video, Palantir. Palantir is another clear winner. They've been working on this stuff for much longer than, you know, it was a buzzword that was out there. And if you look at their numbers, it's very clear that they're a winner in this space long term. And so... You know, those are some of the ones that just come to my mind that I'm like, oh, these are obvious, like winners long term. And there's a lot of other companies that I'm like, maybe, but it's a maybe, right? I, when you're making investments, it's much, it's much easier to make investments, especially if it's a big money investments in things that you know are for sure's rather than maybe, maybe this is the next big thing because maybe it's not as well, right? So just a little foo for thought in regards to that. Alrighty, next one up here. Apple reportedly developed an AI chip. Data centers, according to the Wall Street Journal, our dear DeBose is taking a look at the AI chip arms race for today's tech check. Morning, D. Good morning, Carl. I know you're going to like this name. It's apparently codenamed Project ACDC for Apple Chips in Data Center. And here may lie Apple's advantage in the Gen AI race. This company has the most experience and success in designing its own custom silicon, even if it has been a laggard in terms of laying out that broader AI strategy to investors. At the Apple event in Cupertino this morning that Steve was covering, the company debuted its latest M-series processor, the M4, which it called a, quote, outrageous powerful chip for AI. But AI chips for data centers, that's a different beast and an unproven area. And while that M line of silicon has improved power efficiency performance across Apple devices, Apple has struggled in other areas like developing its own cellular wireless chip to replace Qualcomm silicon. Now the journal reports that Apple's working with Taiwan Semi on a server chip that runs AI models. So that's the inference part of AI versus training. But if that is successful, that could give Apple more control over its AI products and ambitions when it does lay that out, expected at WWDC in a few weeks. Now, as we've discussed, nearly all the mega caps are trying to develop their own Gen AI custom in-house chips. It's about cost and efficiency and countering NVIDIA's dominance. Billionaire investor Stanley Druckenmiller talked about Gen AI and trimming his NVIDIA position on Squawk this morning. We've had a hell of a run. A lot of what we recognized uh, has become recognized by the marketplace now. Long term, 
we're as bullish on AI as we've ever been. The big payoff might be four to five years from now. So AI might be a little overhyped now, but underhyped long term. So he just trimmed his position. He said he wouldn't be surprised if he was holding on to NVIDIA for the next five to 10 years in some way. Um, but to that sentiment, that longer term sentiment, of course, nobody's close to replacing NVIDIA GPUs anytime soon. But Apple and other mega caps, other chip makers, too, they're playing the long game here. Silicon is a very key piece of that strategy. And that will power their apps and products, which is ultimately what they're looking to make, Carl. A couple of reflections. One, I was fascinated by Druckenmiller's answer that he can't imagine not owning NVIDIA on or off for the next five yeah. to ten years. And then just a reminder that Apple's only been in the chip business for, what, a decade maybe? Only, yeah, but I mean, it's a bit of a head start over some of the mega caps. This is true, but I mean, you look at the success that it's had with that M series, right? And how it's made improvements across iPhones and iPads and even the laptops. Apple would tell you that it's been working on AI chips for a long time as well, but this is where it's been a lot harder, right? We talked to a lot of the different mega caps about the chips they're making, Google's TPUs in house, and they say that they're getting better and better, but I think the real test is who's using them, right? They're all being used used inside of their cloud infrastructure. Can you use it for inference? Can you use it to build the foundational models? The race is happening at this level, and that is going to set the ground for the race when we get into the app and the products, which everyone's sort of yeah. looking, looking forward to. Okay, so you know, it might seem like, oh man, all these companies, all the big techs are trying to make their own chips. Isn't that a huge competitive threat to I NVIDIA? Uh, not really, because <laughs> at the end of the day, all these big techs, and I own several of those big techs, right? You can't just, you can't just like say, oh, oh, we're going to make the NVIDIA chip in, and we're going to make it better. Like, it doesn't work like that. Uh, it's like NVIDIA saying, we're going to be social network. We're going to create the next Facebook, and we're also going to create the next Microsoft Office products, and, and, uh, and uh, the next AWS, and we're also going to create this. Like, it doesn't work like that, man. Like, NVIDIA has such a huge advantage over all these guys. And Tesla, Tesla's got arguably the best engineer team in the world. And uh, they've been trying to, you know, make their own chips for years. And at the end of the day, look what they're buying. Look what Elon Musk is talking about on the conference call. NVIDIA chips, NVIDIA chips. They're buying as many as they possibly can get their hands on. 35,000 they got right now. Elon wants to have 85,000 of those chips by the end of this year. You know, you can, you can try to do it, but you can't duplicate it, okay? 